Hello, everyone, and welcome to our short course on bit shift operations. Thanks for joining me. My name is Gustavo Petzi. I teach computer science and mathematics here in London. And whenever I'm teaching students in the undergraduate level, sometimes we stumble across these operators, right, in these high level programming languages. Things like Java, C, 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 Python, JavaScript, Fire, all these high level programming languages, they still have these operators, which we call bit shift, left and right. And most students, they understand this idea that we use these operators to shift bits to the left or to the right, right? You can shift bits two times to the left, you can shift bits two times to the right, one time, three times. But why do we use these things, right? So what is the benefit of shifting things left and right in this kind of low-level bitwise operations? This is what I want to tackle with this very short course. I'm going to reserve one hour, right? So I want, you, I want it to be very fast. Uh, I think it's going to take less than one hour. We're just going to have a discussion about what bit shift is. We are going to understand the mathematics behind shifting these bits left or right. And why do we shift these bits left or right? And why is it beneficial for us, especially as game programmers, right? So when do we use it? Should we use it? Yes or no? So let's understand the mathematics behind it. Because if you understand the mathematics behind, right? So if you really understand the math behind bit shifting, then I'll guarantee that in 10 years, 20 years in the future, you're going to remember, ah, I remember when Gustavo told me how these things work and you'll never forget, right? So if we are thinking about high level languages, we probably stumbled across these operators, right? So we have these operators right here, usually, right? Depending on the language and depending on the implementation, but for example, these things right here, this is us shifting left one bit. This is us shifting left twice, right? So I shift left once, twice, two bits. And I can shift right as well, right? So I can shift some uh, variable right one bit. I can shift right two bits. So what I want to do is zoom in and understand when to use these things and what does it really mean? What does it happen right under the hood with our variable, with our bits in the processor, whenever we ask to shift things left and whenever whatever happens whenever we want to shift things to the right. But before we zoom in and understand what happens in the processor level, right, in memory, in the processor with these bits, I want us to take a step back, right, and trust me, this is relevant, right, this is going to be useful for us to understand. I want you to go back to the basics, to your first grade, second grade of elementary mathematics education, and let's think again of how us humans, how do we count numbers, right? What does it mean to count these quantities that we think of? So the way that we usually think about things, right? If I have 20 cows in my field, if I have 100 corn crops that I have to count, we started this whole process by having these abstract ideas of these things, right? These entities of the real world. And then we had to start counting them, right? We have these ideas of number one, and then we have two cows, three cows, four cows, 10 cows, 11, 11 100. And then if you were really rich back in the day, you had like, let's say 500 cows, right? So we had to find a notation to kind of write these things down. And the way that we started thinking about this is we use what we call the base 10, right? So we use 10 digits, right? So we have 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, and 9, right? So from 0 to 9, those are the digits that we have available to represent these numbers, right? So I pretty much I know that we use this base 10 because I think our anatomy, right? So since we have 10 fingers, also, by the way, fingers are called digits, right? So all these 10 fingers, our anatomy, Kind of forced us to, I think it's easier for us to count in terms of 10, right? So we have these 10 available digits, but also, right? So I can count, let's say, 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, and 9 cows, right? So if I have 10, uh, if I have 9 cows in my field, I can use the digit 9. But what happens if I have 10, 11, 12, 13? So what we usually use is what we call this positional notation, right, of the numbers. So we start adding columns to the left, right? So if I want to represent 10, 11, 12, I add one column to the left, and that column to the left represents how many tens I have, right? So I start repeating again the digits, but then I have one column to the left that says that I have 10, 11, 12. So I have one 
tens, zero ones, one tens, one ones, one tens, two ones. Do you see? So tens and ones, right? So how many tens, how many ones? And since I kind of put these things together, they represent 10, 11, 12, 13, 14. So I have one more column to the left, right? So keep this in mind. Oh, of course. And this thing kind of holds true, right? So if I start counting again, I am going to say 20, right? So I have now two, zero, two, one, two, two. And that continues until I reach the limit of what I can represent with two columns, right? With these two positions. As soon as I go there and I, and I reach 98 and 99, then we don't have any more little placeholders to represent 100, 100, 100, 102. So what we do is we add another column to the left and that column represents how many hundreds I have, right? So one, 100, zero tens, zero ones. So that is 100, 101, 102, and then we start repeating again. Do you get the, the idea, right? So this is what we learn as kids. Sometimes we don't even think too much about this. We just kind of take for granted and that is what we use, right? This is what we call positional notation. I want us to start, stop right now and also think about these columns. Do you see that we have these columns that represent ones, tens, hundreds, and etc. This is, if I have this number, right, this random number, 2,315, right? So each one of those columns, each one of those positions, it holds how many ones, how many tens, how many hundreds, and how many thousands I have. If you look at right here, it's almost like for each one of the columns, I have a specific responsibility for that column, right? So this column right here is going to store how many tens to the zero I have. So how many ones? So five ones. This column right here shows me how many tens to the one, right? So how many tens I have? So I have one tens, right? 15. This other column right here, I have now my base to the second, right? So base squared. So 10 squared. That is how many hundreds I have. That means that I have three times 100, so 300. This other thing right here is 10 cubed, so 1,000. That means 2,000, so 2,315. Each one of these columns, they represent the base raised to one more power, right? So 10 to the 0, 10 to the 1, 10 to the 2, 10 to the 3. This is base 10, right? So this is what we usually use, and this is, as I mentioned, this is how many ones, how many tens, how many hundreds, and how many thousands, and this is what we call positional notation, because each one of these positions, they represent our base raised to one more power, right? And this is going to be useful for us to understand how those bit shifting left and right are going to affect our number, right? So what does it mean to shift left and what does it mean to shift right? What happens to our positional notation with our number? Uh, and what does it mean for us as programmers? Let's zoom in and understand what it means for us to multiply and divide by our base of the numbers that we're dealing with. Right, so we took a trip back to whenever we were four or five years old and kind of just reviewed the way that we think about this positional notation to represent numbers. Right, so we have these 10 digits, we use base 10, and the more I want numbers, the more I have to add columns to the left. Keeping that in mind, I want to review how we think about multiplying numbers whenever we are using our base 10, right? our decimal base. So let's just think about this thing for a minute. So in base 10, right, using our the base that we use as humans, how do we multiply any number by 10? Right? Let's just think about if I have any number, how do I multiply that number by the number 10, by our base? So let's just think, for example, right? Uh, do you see that number? 23. So I, want, I have the number 23. I want to multiply by 10. Let's just give other examples, right? So if I have the number 515, how do I multiply that number by 10? What happens to that number if I multiply by 10? And just the last example, 14 times 10. So look at those examples, right? 23 times 10, 515 times 10, and 14 times 10. Let's look at the first one, 23 times 10. We all know the answer, right? We all know the result to that. So if I want to multiply 23 times 10, what happens is I end up with 230, right? So I kept the two and the three, and do you see how I just added one zero to the right? But 
I want you to think of, as that thing, as not just adding one zero to the right. It's almost like, it's the same thing as if I got my numbers, all those digits, two and three, and I shift them to the left one time. Do you agree? So I put two and three, I shift them to the left, by shifting them to the left, I end up with like an empty position on the right, and I just add a little zero in that padding empty right there. So I shift one time to the left, that means multiplying by 10, right? Keep that in mind. Let's look at another example. 515 times 10, the idea is still the same, right? I will end up with 5,150. I keep 515. And then I just add a zero to that padding right. But again, I don't want you to think of only adding a zero to the right. I want you to think that we got our number, all our digits, and we shifted them left one time. As we shifted them left, we got that empty position on the right, and then we just add a little zero there in that empty space, right? In the little placeholder on the right. 14, same thing. I end up with 140, but it's the same thing as if me getting the digits one and four and shifting them to the left once. So I shift them left once and then I end up with a little empty position. After the shift, I put a little zero there. All these things, shifting once left, right? So if I shift left once and then I add a zero to that padding right that I end up with, that is multiplying by my base 10, right? Right, so that is multiplication by our base 10. What happens in base 10 if I want to multiply any number by 100? You probably get the idea, right, of what's going to happen. So if I have 23 and I want to multiply by 100, if I have 515, or if I have 14 and I want to multiply all of these numbers by 100. If you look at the first example, 23, that means that I'm going to still keep 2 and 3, but then I add two zeros to the right, right? 2,300. That is multiplication by 100. I don't want us to think about adding zeros to the right. I want us to think that this is almost the same as getting the number two, three, and shifting left two times. So left, left. So by shifting once and twice, I end up with these two empty positions on the right. All I do is fill them with zero. That is multiplying by 100. Same idea holds true for this one. So 515, I end up with 51500, zero, zero, but it's almost like I've shifted left 515, one and two, right? So I am shifting these things twice, right? 14, the same thing. I shift one and four, one, two. So I shift left twice, and then I fill with zeros at the right. So whenever I want to multiply any number in base 10 by 100, I shift left twice and I add all those two zeros to the padding right that I end up with, right? So I will end up with this empty two positions at the right, I fill them with zero. Okay, so I think we got the pattern, right? This, this works for base 10, but the beauty is that doesn't work only for 10 and 100. The beauty is that this pattern, this pattern here, it holds true for all the powers of 10. Right, so if I want to multiply by 10, if I want to multiply by 100, by 1,000, 10,000, 100,000, and etc., this is going to hold true. So all I have to do is shift left three times, shift left four times, shift left five times to multiply by uh, 100, 10, uh, 1,000, 10,000, 100,000, 1 million, etc. Right, so this is multiplying by the base, multiplying by the next base raised to the power uh, 2, base to the power 3, 10 to the power 4, 10 to the power 5. Right? So this is how we multiply. It's almost like I am shifting left as many times as I want. 10, 100, 1000, 10,000. So I multiply by my base. Right. This is multiplication in base 10. I don't want to stop right now. I want to discuss something else, right? So we are still talking about base 10, but trust me, this is going to be useful for us in base 2 as well, right? In binary, which is what the computer uses. So this was multiplication in base 10. What happens with division, right? So let's just quickly look at what happens if we want to divide numbers by our base as well. So again, in base 10, right? We are always thinking in base 10 right here. What happens? How do we divide any number by the base 10? So now we want to divide. 
So I want to get, uh, again, some examples, right? So let's say 23, 515, and 74. If I want to divide now these numbers by 10, let's look at the first example, 23. If I divide by 10, now it's come out kind of the opposite, right? I have to eliminate a couple of numbers. So the way that I see that is, if, okay, just a quick parenthesis. Whenever I say division, I'm only talking about the integer part of the division, right? I don't care about the remainder. I don't care about those decimal parts. Let's say 23 divided by 10. I'm only concerned at how many times 10 goes into 23. We, and the result is 2, right? That is the division, the integer part of the division. But the way I like to think about that thing is, I, it's almost like I'm going to discard that rightmost number. So you see the 3? I'm going to discard that 3. I'm going to lose that digit 3. And I shift things to the right once. And I add a 0 to that padding left that I end up with. Right, so this is me dividing any number by 10. By shifting things to the right, I'm going to lose one of those digits, and then I just add a zero into that padding left. Let's look at 515 divided by 10. Same logic applies, right? I am going to shift things to the right once. I'm going to lose, I'm going to discard that rightmost 5. So I'm just going to end up with 5, 1. But then I put a little zero in that padding left that I have. Same thing, right? You probably get the idea. 74 divided by 10, I shift things uh, to the right once, and then I lose that 4. I discard that rightmost 4. I end up with 0, 7, right? I end up, actually, I end up with 7, but then I put a little zero in the left. Right, so that is division by 10. You know already what is coming next. What if I want to divide any number by 100? So 230 divided by 100, let's say 515 divided by 100, and a bigger one, 3,911 divided by 100. So this thing right here, the same logic applies. If I want to now divide by 100, I'm going to lose two of those numbers because I'm going to shift right once, twice, right? So I shift right two times, and all I have to do is fill with zeros on the left most places. That's it, right? The whole logic still, the pattern still holds true for this as well. I just have to shift right two times now. Same thing here. So 515 divided by 100, I end up with 5, and then I just fill with 0, right? So I shift right one, two times. And 3,911 divided by 100, I end up with, if I shift right and shift right again, I am going to end up with 39 and then 0, 0, 39. Do you see? So if this thing right here, to divide any number by 10, I shift right once and add zeros to the padding left. To divide by 100, I shift right twice and add two zeros to the padding left. And also the beauty of this thing is the pattern holds true for all the powers of 10. So if I want to divide by 10, 100, 1000, 10,000, and etc., all I have to do is shift right the correct amount of times, right? So shift right once, shift right uh, two times, three times, four times. How many shift rights I perform is how much I want to divide by the base, right? So that is the whole purpose of this like, whole explanation that I kind of gave, right? This multiplication, thinking again of how we count things in base 10. Uh, so the amount of things that I want to multiply or I want to divide, it means how many times I want to add the base or subtract the base, right? Because each one of each time that I shift left or each time that I shift right, it means how many times I'm going to add one more time the base or subtract one more time the base. Shift left and shift right, right? Multiplication, division. That is the whole point, right? This was base 10, right? And you know, of course, you know that in the next slides, I'm going to talk about base 2. So we are going to see how everything that we Kind of just reviewed and kind of just do, did a quick review on base 10. This is going to be true as well for base 2. And base 2 is important because this is what our computer, our processor uses, right? We use the binary uh, notation, the binary representation to represent uh, digital numbers in the machine. So let's just quickly look uh, and how these things still work for base 2, right? For our binary 
uh, machine representation. We usually use what we call base two, right? These binary numbers. Base two because we basically have these two possible states. We don't have 10 possible digits to represent numbers. We only have two. Things are either stimulated or not stimulated, right? Uh, if I look at a processor, a little processor pin, electricity is either high voltage or low voltage, right? That is kind of how I think about this one and zero. Things are either on or off, right? It's stimulated or not stimulated. So given that we have only these two digits, right? These two different options of representing numbers, we have a more limited approach, right? So now we have to understand what happens with this bit shifting left and right for our base two. So given that we have these ideas, let's just quickly move forward and look at what happens whenever we multiply things in base two, in binary. So in binary, right, let's just think of a very simple binary number. I just picked the number 101, right? So this is the number 101. And I wanted to remember that this, the whole idea of positional notation, it also is also true for binary numbers, right? So this thing right here, this position represents how many twos to the zero. This is how many ones. This next column here represents how many twos to the one, right? So you see, is my base raised to one. This next column represents how many twos squared. So how many fours I have, how many eights, how many sixteens, how many thirty twos. So you see, each one of these columns represents how many powers of two I have. So this is, this is why I wanted to stop and review before the base 10 positional notation, because it kind of resonates a little bit more with us. But this is also true for binary numbers, right? Each one of these columns, each one of these positions, they represent one more power of my base, right? On my base two. So just quick review, this number right here, one, zero, one, this means that I have one, two to the zero. So this is one times one. So one time, uh, plus this is two to the two. So this means how many fours? So one fours, one one. So this is four plus one. This number is five, right? So this number right here is five. I just chose to put all those zeros on the left because I wanted to represent an entire byte, right? So one byte is eight bits. So just so we have all the little, all the eight bits here for this byte, I just filled the left with zeros. But this is 101, the decimal number five, or the binary number 101. Right, so quick review of the notation, positional notation, quick review of these little positions being each one of these columns are powers of my base. So what happens, right? So what happens if I decide to go and shift things to the left, right? So what happens if I shift left once? So if I shift left once, this is what happens to my number. I end up with one, zero, one. And since I shifted everything left, I end up with this empty position. I'm just gonna go ahead and put a little zero here. So it's almost like I am using one, I'm moving everything to the next power of two right, to the next power of two, so one column to the left, and this one right here end up with zero. So this one right here, one, zero, one, zero, this means no ones, one twos, no fours, one eight. So eight plus two, 10. Do you see? This is the same as multiplying this original number by two. So if I shift things left once, I am multiplying by my base right? So my base two. So this thing right here is the same as multiplying by two. Shifting things left once is the same as multiplying by my base, which is in this case binary, right? It is two. And you know already what's going to happen. If I, want to if I want to shift left twice, so if I shift left and shift left again, now I moved everything one, uh, two columns to the left, and then I end up with these two empty spaces. I put zeros, this is going to be my number multiplied by my next power of the base. So I multiply this by two squared, four. So this is exactly the same as multiplying by four. In a nutshell, shifting things left twice means that I want to multiply my binary number by four. So shifting thing left, 
once multiplied by 2, shifting things left twice multiplied by 4. If I want to shift things left three times, this is the same as multiplying by my next power of 2. So this is the same as multiplying by 8. So if I want to multiply by 2, 4, 8, 16, 32, 64, I have to only shift things left as many times as I want. This is the logic and this is why these things work. Right? You will see that programmers, instead of just multiplying things by 2, multiplying things by 4, you will see them shifting things left once, th shifting things left twice. That is the whole reason why we use shifting things left and right. All right? So if multiplication in base 2, we shift things left, you know that division in base 2 is going to mean that we're going to shift things right. Right. So I can only basically shift things right and I'm going to divide by my base, the power, of I want, the power that I want from the base 2. So same thing, right? I have all these columns with this positional notation. So this is how many 1s, 2, 4, 8, 16, 32s. And I just pick this number, right? 1, 0, 1, 1, 0, 1. If I shift things right one time, right? So if I shift things right one time, I'm going to basically lose this one right here. It's going to be discarded. And I end up with 1, 0, 1, 1, 0. And that empty padding left that I have, I just put a little zero at the end, right? So that is the same as dividing by two. So is this number in binary is the same as this original one divided by two. You get the idea, right? So if I want to shift right uh, two times, I'm going to divide by four. And if I shift right three times, I'm going to divide by 8, and if I shift right 4 times by 16, 5 times by 32, so I divide by the base, right? I divide by 2, 4, 8, 16, 32, and etc. So every time that I increment the amount of shifts that I do, I'm, al I'm always going one more power of my base, right? So 2, 4, 8, 16, 32, which is the same idea that we were looking before in base 10. But since we're using base 2, that is what it is. Perfect. So we just learned the mathematics behind these ideas of shifting things left and right. And what that really means, right? I am multiplying or dividing by my base again and again, depending on how many shifts I do left or right. All right. So just to put things into context, I wrote a very simple, very vanilla C program right here. So I have my main function, and then I'm declaring a variable, an integer variable, called some number equal to 100, I initialize that variable with the value 100, and then I have this variable result, and then result is equal to some number times 2. And I'm using the vanilla way of multiplying numbers, right? I'm saying I'm using the asterisk, the star operator. That is multiplying by 2, right? Nothing new here. But I just wanted to point out that we have these operators right here, right? I have this shift left operator, right? This kind of angle brackets right here. This one here, shifts by one bit, shifting two bits, shifting three bits, right? So by shifting one time to the left, this is exactly the same as multiplying my original number by two. If I shift two bits to the left, this is equivalent to multiplying by four, right? My next power of the base. So two multiply by four, multiply by eight, multiply by 16, depending on how many bytes I want to shift to the left. This is an example of Instead of using the star to multiply by the base 2, this thing right here is equivalent, right? So I can say my sum number, my original number, shift left by one bit. That is exactly the same as multiplying by 2. So these two lines right here, they are equivalent, right? The question that remains is, why would anyone prefer to use this kind of obscure syntax instead of just going and using this more readable one, right? Which is a lot easier to read, it's a lot easier on the eyes to just see the little star. Well, we have to stop for a moment and kind of go back to the 90s and early 2000s, right? Whenever we were talking about processors and the way that we implemented these arithmetic computations in these early processors, right? In the 80s, 90s, and early 2000s. So if we think about the way that older processors used to work, right? I just, I, to give an example, this is a processor called 6502. And the 6502 processor, even though it was a great processor back in the day, it was very limited, right? If you compare to modern processors that we have today. For example, just to give an example of limitations that we had. 
there was no native instruction to multiply or divide using the 6502. So if you wanted to multiply a value, you had to load that value and then do a series of additions, right? So to multiply, you had to add, 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 add until you reach the result that you wanted. And the same thing, if you wanted to divide a value, you have to load the original value and then subtract, 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 subtract until you reach the division that you wanted. You see, lots of limitations, right? But that being said, the manufacturer of the processor, right? MOS, that, uh, the creator of the processor, whenever they were manufacturing, they have a native way, a native instruction to shift things left or right. So there is an opcode, there is a machine instruction to go and say, I want to shift whatever is inside the register of the processor, left or right. So I think the key word here is performance. This instruction, shift left and shift right, is a lot faster than the alternative, right? To, you know, getting the value from the memory, parsing the little asterisk, multiplying, or a series of multiplications. There were a lot of clock cycles involved. If I just use the shift left native or, or shift right native instruction, it's a lot faster for the processor. And I want you to remember, we are talking about the 80s, the 90s, right? Every little performance that I can squeeze out of my processor represents a lot of gain in terms of performance of my game, performance of my simulation, or whatever I'm programming, right? So having this native shift left and native shift right instructions, that is the key of why programmers use shift left and shift right a lot until the early 2000s, right? So just to kind of keep things and give some perspective again, you know that processors, they work with these things called registers, right? So inside the processor, we have these registers, and registers are ways of storing binary numbers there, right? Uh, in the case of the 6502, we have a register called the A register, right? So inside the A register, given that, this, given that the 6502 is an 8-bit processor, I can store 8 bits right here. So let's just say that I have this number 100, right? This thing is the number 4, right? 100 is 4. So I am loading the value 4 inside my A register. I can just quickly go and instruct my processor. I can go and stimulate my processor pins and send the machine code that represents shift left. As soon as the processor receives that machine code that represents shift left, that is hardwired inside the processor, it knows that it has to go and shift the A register to the left once. And that is the whole point, right? So if I have this native shift left, this is a lot faster than whatever, um, whatever other option that I have to multiply things. So by shifting left once, I am basically multiplying this value by two, right? So this is what I wanted to point. Uh, again, let me just show the assembly code version of this, right? So if I am programming for the 6502, I can use assembly code, right? Assembly code is just these instructions that the processor is going to execute one after the other. First instruction, LDA hash four. This is a comment, right? It says load the accumulator, uh, load the register A with the value four. So this is pretty much the same thing as we see right here. We are loading with one zero zero, right? Loading with four. And then I have this native instruction, this opcode in assembly language, which is ASL, which, which is what we call arithmetic shift left. So I'm shift left once, shift left twice, shift left three times. This is the same as multiplying four by two, four, eight, right? So at the end of these instructions, I am multiplying my original value inside the A register by eight, because I'm performing three shift lefts. You see? Assembly code, don't worry too much if you don't know assembly code, just to give an example of what happens in the processor level, right? And these things right here, this ASL, this shift left, is super fast, right? That is why we still see, uh, and we still saw programmers using this shift left and shift right, because they wanted to squeeze performance out of their games. And that is the whole, whole point. In higher level languages, what we have is what we saw before, right? So I can have uh, this operator to shift left, and I say how many bits I want to shift left, right? So this some number left left one is shifting left one bit. That is the same as I have times two, right? It's the same as multiplying by two. 
If I shift left two bits, it's the same multiplying by four, multiplying by eight, and then the same thing applies for the others, right? 16, 32, 64, etc. So this is what you will see. Uh, for example, if you open source code of games programmed in C, right? If you open, for example, Wolfenstein 3D that was programmed by each software, you will see a lots of shift left, lots of shift right to perform this multiplication and division. Because back in the day, whenever they were programming Wolfenstein 3D, the processors that they were using, right, the 286 processor, the pre-86 processor, that was a lot of, uh, it was a lot faster to perform this thing than to go and use the start operator, parse that multiplication, do all those clock cycles, right? This is a lot faster. And uh, that is how they were able to kind of get that speed, that performance out of the game that they were programming, right? So what I want to do right now is let's go and let's open the code editor and let's let's open the code of Wolfenstein 3D and see if we can spot some of the elements or some of the examples or where they use this shift left and right, right? See if you can reason about why they decided to do that and what that really means for the source code of Wolfenstein 3D, right? So let's go to our Linux terminal. Let's open our code editor and let's start uh, kind of searching for some shift left and right in the Wolfenstein 3D code. So as you can see here, I have my home folder and inside my home folder, I have a subfolder called BitShift. And I'm going to open my code editor right here and edit this main.c file that I just created, right? It's a very basic C file where I just added a couple of variables. So I start this variable num with the value five, right? Just a random value. And then I proceed to create these variables called times two, times four, times eight, times 16, because as you probably realize, I want to show how shifting to the left once, twice, three times, four times, five times, they will give me the correct multiplication by 2, 4, 8, 16, 32, right? The powers of my base 2. So I get my variables correctly and then I just proceed to print F them in the console. And that's it, right? This is the most basic program that we can have. So let me just show how these things work. I'm going to compile my file first, so very quickly, I'm gonna use GCC. And I'm gonna create an output executable called main. So perfect, no errors. And if I execute main, I see exactly what I expect to see. Right, so five times two is 10, five times four is 20, and etc. right? So, these multiplications right here, they were being performed using the left bit shift operator of the C language. So this was just a review, right? I just wanted to show to you how these things are actually implemented and how we can use this left shift and right shift operators in the C language. But what I really wanted to show to you right now was an example of a valid professional source code that uses bit shift. And for that, I decided to open the source code of the Wolfenstein 3D. So all I did was I went there, I cloned that Git repository, and I have here this folder, right, called Wolf 3D. So if I list the files here, I have another folder called Wolf SRC, which is the source code of the Wolfenstein 3D. And inside this folder, if I just list my files, so here they are, right? So I have all the C files, the header files, and as you can see, they are in that MS-DOS format, right? I have eight characters for the file name and then three characters for the extension. And you can see that they are all in caps, right? So those were the days. So since I have here my C files, my header files, let's see if we can spot some occurrences of bit shifts being performed to the right and left. Uh, so whenever John Carmack, right, the programmer from each software, whenever he created this source code, I know that he used a lot of bit shifting left and right to perform these divisions and multiplications. So having our files right here, I'm going to do a very naive search. So I'm going to use grep. So I'm going to search for a certain string pattern, right? So I want to search for left, left. Right? So let's see if I can find this pattern right here in 
all the files, right? And even better, right? Let me just uh, put a little recursive here, right? To include the subfolders as well. So I'm gonna include all the subfolders. I'm gonna look for this pattern right here. So left, left. And you know what? Just so it doesn't pollute my terminal, let me just send the output of this comment to something called results.txt. Right, so we're going to send all this output to this file. Perfect. So if I just quickly check results.txt. Oh, wow. You see? Loads of occurrences. So here we have all the files and the occurrences of that string pattern that I searched for. So for example, in the tech.c, I have something that goes and says port shift left four. This one shift left by XS, YS. So I was not lying to you. There are several occurrences of this thing right here. So all of these lines are examples of source code that is using shift left. This is only shift left, right? We didn't even search for shift right. So all these files, they are examples of files that contain that shift left inside. Perfect. So let me just open. I was looking at something yesterday. I think the name was WL for wolf state.c. Right? So this state file right here is a normal C implementation file. And let me look for unsigned. Yeah, so right here, this was one example of the source code that I saw that John Carmack was using shift left and shift right. Nothing too crazy here, right? Just a little function called check line. We have a couple of variable declarations here. And then this part right here, do you see how we are initializing x1 with the object pointer x component? And then we are performing a shift right and we are using this constant, right? Unsigned shift right here. And I know for a fact that this unsigned shift, it is declared. Let me just open something called wolf def for the definitions, right? So there's this file, this header file with the definitions of things. So if I look for, here it is. So inside this wolf definitions, I have this definition right here. So I'm defining this constant called unsigned shift and John Carmack loaded the value eight there. So unsigned shift has the value eight. That means that I am right shifting eight bits. So if we think about the logic that we just learned before, if I shift things right eight bits, that is the same as dividing by two to the power eight. And divide by two to the power eight, it really matches this comment right here that John Carmack just said, right? So this is one divided by 256 tile precision. So this has probably to do with the calculations of the tiles of the map of the Wolfenstein 3D. But this division right here, this comment right here, one divided by 256 makes sense, right? I am dividing by two to the power eight right shifting eight times. So John Carmack is dividing things by 256 here, dividing here again by 256. Same thing here, right? It's doing another calculation. It's just not using a constant for some reason. So here's the proof, right? The programmer is using right shift and left shift to solve these ideas of multiplying and dividing. And the reason that he's doing this especially in the source code, is to squeeze as much performance as he can out of the processor that this game was designed for, right? So this was designed first for the IBM 286. And for the IBM 286, to have this right shift and left shift really made a difference in terms of performance, correct? It is faster than just doing a vanilla division in this case. And if you kind of navigate here in your code, you will see a lot of other examples of shift right and left. So right here, I just found another one, right? So it is using this delta shift left eight bits. If we come down here, we'll probably find some other examples again. There we go. We have another delta left shift eight bits again. There is another right shift right there. So right shift eight bits. So you see, there's a lot of right shift left shift by this 256, which is probably a very important constant for the programmer in this case. 
Okay, so I'm not going to go and analyze all the occurrences and explain everything that is being done. I just wanted to take this moment to show to you that, yes, I'm not lying to you, back in the day, we used this a lot whenever we were coding our games. And another example that, uh, let me just write this right here. So another example that I usually see in games, especially from the MS-DOS era, is a type of code that I usually saw whenever people were trying to access the VGA graphics. Right, so if you remember back in the day, in the MS-DOS era, we have this idea of these monitors, right? These graphics devices that were using these VGA graphics. And VGA, the resolution that we had in pixels, one of the classic resolutions was 320 by 200. So it was 320 by 200, right? This is the resolution that I had, 320 width by 200 height. And you will see several times, since 320, for example, is not a perfect multiple of these powers of 2, what you would see is programmers would even break things down into the closest solution of these powers of 2. So if I wanted to multiply something by 320, what you will see programmers do is, instead of 320, we are going to break 320 into, for example, 256 plus 64, right? So 320 is 256 plus 64. And since 256 is 2 to the power 8 and 64 is 2 to the power 6, this thing right here is achieved by doing, let's say, a number shift left 8 plus a number shift left 6. This thing right here is the same as multiply by 320. Right, so there is a lot of tricks that were involved. We try to break things into these perfect powers of two, and then whenever we can, we add them. Everything to try to squeeze as much performance as we can out of this bit shift left and right. Okay, so I just wanted to pause, show some examples of source code, show a little bit of the tricks that we did whenever we couldn't break things into perfect powers of two, we can find the closest solution and then add them together to get to the result that we want. And these things right here, they take me back, right? We use these things a lot, a lot back in the day. I have a feeling that everything is starting to make more sense now that we saw a couple of source code examples, right? People using this shift left and right in the wild, and of course, understanding the mathematics, right? What does it mean for us to shift left? What does it mean for us to shift right? And how that relates to the idea of adding powers of two and etc. But before I move forward and we end our short course, I just want to talk about these two different options of shifts that we have. You will see programmers talk about arithmetic shift or logical shift. Right? And to explain the differences between what is an arithmetic shift or a logical shift, we have to just go back and think again of how we represent numbers in digital machines. Right? So again, you know by now that we use this thing called binary numbers. Right? So inside our processor registers, inside our memory, we use these numbers, right? these binary states of the value. But to represent numbers, is not enough for us to represent only integer numbers, right? As humans, we need to represent this conceptual idea of negative numbers as well. So I need to have a way of representing the value 5 or negative 5, uh, plus 1 or negative 1, right? So I need a way of representing negative numbers. And I'm going to simplify a lot the explanation, right? But what we use is something called choose complement. Right? And choose complement is this idea of we reserve. Do you see that leftmost bit that we have? Right, The leftmost bit where I have a 1 there. That bit, we are going to reserve that bit. It's not going to be part of our actual number, the magnitude of our number, but we're going to call that one the sign bit. So that leftmost bit is going to be reserved to represent if that number is positive or negative. In other words, I'm going to reserve that leftmost bit to tell me if, if I have a 1 there, it means that this number is negative. If I have a 0 there, it means that it is a positive number. Right? So that is why we call, when we reserve that bit, and we call it a sign bit. 
the whole point is, do you agree that if I choose to shift things to the right, right? So if I shift things right, if I move everything to the right, I move all those bits to the right and then I add a zero on the leftmost bit. So by performing this thing right here, I am losing the idea of that sign bit, right? Because I'm kind of just moving things to the right without considering if that thing was negative or positive. So this thing right here, whenever we shift things right, not considering and not protecting the sign bit, this is a logical shift right. But there is a way of performing what we call an arithmetic shift right, where we keep the sign bit. So this thing right here, we still shift things to the right, but we keep a copy of that sign bit. So, right, in a nutshell, arithmetic shift, this one right here, makes a copy of the sign bit and then puts that sign bit again what it was. So if it was a negative number, then it just shifts everything to the right, but keeps a copy of that one that was there in the first place, right? So this is the main difference. Do I respect the sign of my number or I don't respect the sign of my number? Do I have to worry about the sign bit or I don't have to worry about the sign bit, right? And do you see how in the left part there, I have those three angle brackets and here the arithmetic shift is two angle brackets you will see that high level languages, let's just look at, for example, what Java does, right? So this thing right here is an example of uh, bit shifting on a high level language. This is bit shifting in Java. I can say, I can tell Java to say result, right? A variable is equal to a number, angle brackets, angle brackets, another number, right? So if I use these two angle brackets in Java, this is arithmetic shift right or sometimes also called a signed shift right. It makes sense, right? We keep the sign. The sign of the number is important to us. So this is an example of arithmetic shift right. But in Java, there is a way of explicitly telling Java that I want to use a logical shift right. If I don't care about the sign bit, I can use those three angle brackets. So this is a logical or called sometimes unsigned shift right. right? So the whole idea is, Whatever we are programming, is this number, is this variable, do I care about the sign bit? Yes or no. Right? So I can go and I can explicitly say, Java, I want to use and perform an arithmetic shift right, or I want to perform a logical shift right. It has everything to do with the sign, right? The sign of the number, positive or negative. Just to conclude the examples, uh, if you look at languages like C, C++, or even Go, the implementation of these languages, they choose which right shift to perform depending on the type of the integer being shifted. So do you remember, right? if you ever programmed with C or C++ before, there are ways that whenever we are declaring a variable, I can declare a variable unsigned int variable or int variable, right? So I can, as a programmer, I can say, this is a variable that I want to store negative and positive numbers. Right? If it is just a normal int, it is a signed int. Or I can just say unsigned int if I don't care about the sign bit, if I don't care about negative numbers. C, C++, and Go, they are examples of languages that they choose what type of shift they are going to perform based on the variables that they are performing those shift. So if we are talking about a signed integer, they are going to use an arithmetic shift. And if we are talking about unsigned variables, then it is going to perform a logical shift, right? So under the hood, right, behind the scenes, the language implementation knows what type of bit shifting is going to perform, arithmetic or logical, right? Depend, it has everything to do with the sign, with positive or negative numbers, right? So that is the main difference between arithmetic shifts and logical shifts. I thought it was important for us to also cover this little nuance of the of this whole ideas of bit shift. All right, we are reaching the final lap. I told you it was going to be super fast, but I think we covered very important little details, right? I think it's important for us to understand these things. The question that remains is, uh, students, they come to me and they say, okay, Gustavo, we learn about this shift left, shift right. Why don't we see more shift left and right 
in high-level programming languages, right? Implementations. And that has everything to do with the idea of how relevant bit shifting left and right are in modern machines, right? So just to keep things, uh, let's keep it real, right? So the whole idea is, should we use bit shifting in our source code, yes or no? As a rule of thumb, I would say that modern machines, we usually don't have to worry too much about this. So as a programmer, right, I have been working with these things for a long time, uh, there are two important things. First of all, not everyone in my team, right, if I look at the in, in the industry, the colleagues that I had in the industry, or even in academia, other professors, there are some people, especially if they are from the business side, right, IT and business side, web developers, you know, these people that work with mobile development, they don't know exactly how these things work. And to be honest, they don't have to. It doesn't matter. They are absolutely productive practitioners. They are incredible programmers and they don't know. They never encounter these ideas of bit shifting left or right. And that is fine, right? The types of applications that they use, it has to do a lot more with uh, implementing these functions and reasoning about these business rules than actually understanding bits, right? They don't have to flip those bits that often. And also, I would say that modern processors, right, and especially compilers, they are super good when it comes to optimizing these things. So even if you don't use bit shifting left or right, whenever you're multiplying things or dividing things, the processor already knows how to optimize these things uh, behind the scenes for you. All right. So just to uh, leave things written down, I would say that should we use bit shifting, yes or no? Well, it completely depends on the target device, the language, the purpose. So it depends. If you are implementing business solutions, probably you wouldn't even have to worry about these things. If you are implementing games, Again, it depends, right? Uh, I would say that as a rule of thumb, don't use it, right? Unless you are absolutely sure that you're gonna have performance gain, right? So start by using normal multiplication, start by writing normal uh, division, because we don't know exactly if you are gonna have a performance gain. Most of, and most importantly, modern compilers, right? If you if you look at GCC, Clang, or even the Microsoft Visual Studio compiler that you have, these things, they are super good when it comes to optimizing things, right? We don't even see. We write things and they are optimizing things under the hood. And chances are that your compiler is already optimizing a lot of these things under the hood, right? So my rule is usually I don't write it down because I think I usually prefer code readability. It's a lot easier for other people, for your team members to read your code if you are not using bit shifting, right? Bit shifting is still has a little bit of an obscure syntax, right? Not everyone in the team understand. If you are shifting things right or left using those operators, you will probably have to spend your time explaining to a junior programmer or a junior developer what that really means. And I think the rule is, if you are not gonna have any performance gain, which is usually gonna be the case, I wouldn't use them. Right? I know it's kind of funny that we spend one hour talking about bit shifting uh, and then I come here and I say, don't use it, right? But the point is, I noticed that several students, they have this, they know that they should know about this, but they feel a little bit bad because they don't know how it works. Why we are here today is, I want to remove that fear. I, I want you to understand exactly what bit shifting operators do. And if you ever encounter them in your code, there you go. You know already what they do right? But you are mature enough to know that you sometimes shouldn't use them, right? So it's all about kind of understanding and being aware and being sober, right? Having a sober decision on where we should use these things or not. I would say that there are some cases, right? In the past year or so, I have developed games where I actually saw a couple of performance gain by using shift left and right. So I would say that they are still a little bit relevant, right? In most applications, they are not, but sometimes they are still a little bit relevant. You see, I was talking about compiler optimization. Let me just show you one example right here of what I was looking the other day. So I'm going to talk about compiler optimization and how this whole idea of shifting things left or right, sometimes they are a little bit transparent to us. So what I did is I went there and I wrote a very basic, I wrote very basic two functions, right? So I have a function A and a function B. And these functions, they receive parameters. 
And what I'm doing is the first function, A, I am using a multiplication by two using the vanilla asterisk, right? Using the multiplication operator. And function B, I am using a return X shift left by one bit. Do you agree that mathematically, right? If you think about the purpose of these two functions, they are going to give me the same result, right? These things are going to return the parameter multiplied by two, right? That is what they do. So what I was trying to do is, I went there, I compiled, I used uh, Clang, right? I used the compiler Clang to go, but I, I chose to, I wanted Clang to show me the assembly, right? The kind of assembly generated by that, uh, by that code. So don't worry, again, this is uh, x64, right? This is um, x86 assembly code. If you look at these two things, this is function A, this is function B. If you go and you kind of pause and you look at the implementation on in assembly of these things, you will see that the implementation of these two things, they are virtually the same, right? They are pretty much equivalent. So the compiler optimized these two things to do exactly the same thing. And funny enough, I just noticed that I was just looking at the assembly instructions. What the compiler did in this case, it, it replaced both of these functions with addition, right? So they are actually doing x plus x. You agree? x plus x, the same as x times 2. So instead of using a multiplication, the processor is using a simple addition of x plus x. Again, optimized, right? It went there and analyzed. It knows. It is smart enough to know that that is what we're trying to do. It just went there and kind of replaced, even without telling us what it was doing. So just an example of how the compiler is usually smarter than we are nowadays, right? So that is, I wanted to point out that it doesn't matter what I was trying to do, the compiler already was smarter than I was and uh, replaced everything with the best option in this case, right? In this case was the best option, right? So yeah, I think it was important for me to just expand, show, this is uh, Clang, but if you use GCC, if you use any other compiler, any modern compiler that optimizes thing, you will probably something very similar to this, right? So I think it was uh, an important conclusion that we have right now, right? It is important for us to know what these things are, right? Understand how these things, go back to the basics, understand how these things work, uh, analyze a couple of historical examples of where we used that in the past, but also be mature enough to know that nowadays, if we don't have to use these things, right? If you don't try to be clever in your code, it's always better if we don't try to be too clever and prefer to be readable, right? I want my code to be readable. I want everyone to go and say, okay, multiply by two, move on with my day. And we don't have to worry about, oh, what is this two angle brackets doing here, right? So only use bit shifting if you are absolutely sure, if you measure and if you know for sure that you're gonna have performance gain out of the bit shift, all right? So, there you go, bit shifting operators, less than one hour, good stuff.